Sibiris, lá em 2003, 2004, foi para mim, pessoalmente, logo que eu entrei no Ibama. É, mas agora a gente vai chamar o nosso amigo, nosso segundo palestrante internacional, é, ele vem da Dinamarca, ele tem graduação e mestrado em Geografia, e com foco em sistemas de informações geográficas e censuramento remoto. Ele trabalhou com censuramento remoto é, numa ONG no Sudeste Asiático, é, nos anos de 2000 a 2004. É, é, em 2000 a 2004, é, passando pelo Laos, Tailândia, Filipinas, é, trabalhou também para a FAO, e, atualmente, ele é o coordenador de sistemas de informações geográficas no Ministério do Meio Ambiente da Dinamarca e é também o vice-coordenador do grupo de usuários do QGIS na Dinamarca. Com vocês, então, eu não falei o nome dele, Morten Bild Kias. Obrigado. Uh, I just need to point out. So uh, thank you, George, for inviting me. It was a nice meeting, uh, George, in Denmark, <laughs> uh, and exchanging ideas. And uh, before I start my my own presentation, I would just like to comment on uh, on the past few days. Um, I think it's been really interesting to see all the the projects you have presented and all the different solutions to them also noticed uh, the comment about how we all have this perfect uh, project and solution, uh, but how come we don't talk together more and, and make solutions together? Uh, so, but fortunately, the solution to this problem is right in front of us, is, is meetings like this, where we uh, meet and exchange knowledge. And uh, every time one of you uh, say, oh, I have to uh, talk to you after the, the presentation because the two of us can exchange knowledge. That makes it all worthwhile to have these meetings. So it's very nice to see. And uh, oh yeah, and the little uh, comment about um, the answer is 42, but what was the question? <laughs> I love that film, by the way. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's all about asking the right questions before you start making um, the whole uh, production of how, how can we solve this problem. Make sure you, uh, you spend your time uh, formulating the problem. What is it that we want to solve before we start uh, solving it? So, yeah, with that in mind, um, I'm uh, from Denmark, and uh, I'm actually here uh, representing two different organizations. On one hand, I'm uh, at the Ministry of Environment in Denmark, and on the other hand, I'm also representing uh, the Danish QGIS uh, user group. So, um, let me see. Uh, it's okay. I'll just see. I'll, I'll find them. I actually brought some stickers like uh, the Brazilian uh, user group guy, but I will find them in a minute. Yeah. Okay. So, overview of my presentation. Uh, a few fun facts about Denmark. Uh, the beginning of free open software in Denmark. Uh, QGIS in Denmark. Use of QGIS in uh, Svana. That is, in Danish, it's, <laughs> of course, different. So, that's how we shorten uh, the, the name, which is, uh, in English, Agency for Water and Nature, Nature Management. And then, uh, very shortly, a few plugins that has uh, helped my users in the, in the ministry. And a short comment about how to set data free. And then uh, a brand new project that uh, I'm about to start up with a variety of organizations I want to talk to you about. And finally, free beer. <laughs> okay. So just to get you uh, acquainted with Denmark, it's on top of Europe, uh, like a crown. 
Uh, and I've just, because uh, we all love maps here, I've put uh, Denmark in the center of uh, Brazil so you can see the size. <laughs> We're not very big. Um, and, but of course, depends. We're only uh, 5.6 million, and you are plus 200 million, I think. And uh, 43,000 square kilometers, and you're like 8 million or <laughs> plus. <laughs> so you're a lot bigger. But uh, of course, I haven't taken into account uh, down in this corner. Which one is this? Ah, this one. This one. That's Greenland. And uh, it's more than 2 million <laughs> square kilometers. Uh, of course, it's mostly ice. Uh, but we have a, <laughs> it's a big block of ice that's melting fast, <laughs> unfortunately. So we are also feeling. Um, the consequences of uh, climate change. Okay, and um, this I brought to, to show you. Uh, of course, we use uh, Sentinel. Uh, it's a European uh, satellite. Uh, but, um, but if you look at, uh, at, at Denmark, uh, there's not a lot of forest in Denmark. And um, there used to be but basically we chopped it all down. So uh, my urge to you is <laughs> don't do the same. <laughs> uh, and I'm glad to see that you are, are taking a lot of preventive measures to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, fortunately, it's going up again. <laughs> so um, I think uh, at the end of the uh, 1800th century, uh, forest cover was Four, five percent, and now it's 14, and our aim is at least 20 percent again. Um, the reason was that uh, we built a, a lot of uh, warship in in wood <laughs> uh, to fight the British, <laughs> and um, and so the the king actually orders uh, the the forest uh, agency uh, to to plant more trees to make uh, ships. It takes a while to grow trees, so um, two years ago we informed the Navy that their trees were ready now after 100 years, with a smile. But <laughs> so, okay, so um, open source software in Danish public sector. First time it was mentioned was back in 2003 uh, in the Danish government software strategy. But actually it was uh, only a few years later that it came into uh, an actually policy statement uh, with the policy on open source software. And this uh, led to uh, some variety of, uh, of platforms, but notably uh, there was a software exchange platform uh, with the, the formulation of 45 open source uh, projects across government agencies. So this was uh, a cooperation uh, between uh, a lot of Danish uh, agencies uh, to, to look into how can we create software with open source code that we can uh, change so it suits us, uh, our agency, but that we can reuse these things. And uh, it has led to a, a lot of uh, good software that uh, are being used over and over again in, uh, in Danish government. Uh, and I think uh, quite recently we've had a new portal that uh, also shares knowledge. So, Okay, so um, I'll just uh, touch upon um, QGIS uh, Denmark. This is our stickers. You can have one if you want. Um, we are not as old as the Brazilian one. I think you said six years or something. We are... We're babies. We are. We just uh, celebrated one year anniversary, uh, but it's it's going fast. Um, in the first year, we have uh, 250 uh, members, and uh, this covers uh, government agency, municipalities, private companies, universities, NGOs, and even a, a few students. And. Um, our aim is, of course, to, uh, to expand the use of uh, QGIS in Denmark. And we do this by uh, having uh, meetings uh, regularly, uh, sharing information and knowledge like here today uh, about plugins and uh, 
we also have meetings uh, where we meet and translate Kyrgyz into, uh, into Danish. So um, I think it's very important also to have it in the original language for many users. Um, maybe not for, for us that are uh, GIS users uh, every day, but uh, for, um, for slightly less uh, advanced GIS users. Yes, and um, I think it was two months, two, three months ago, we bought the site also, the domain, qgis.dk, um, and set up the, the site. So uh, to make it easy, you just press the button and fill out the form, and you are a member. <laughs> and uh, you can read about the different uh, meetings we have and how to get started with QGIS, and you can find all sorts of information on the on Danish plugins also. So I just saw this uh, used yesterday, and I thought, hmm, I'll just uh, make a slide here. This is uh, for um, for Denmark, Google Trends uh, in Denmark. And as you can see, uh, MapInfo uh, has gone down considerably, and QGIS has surpassed uh, the, the search. So it's it's gaining interest, and it's, uh, it's growing fast. Uh, and Arcus and QGIS uh, getting closer. It's, uh, we're going to beat them. <laughs> and uh, yes, the, um, the new version of uh, QGIS, I don't know if you've noticed, it's called uh, Nødebo <laughs> or Nødebo. Uh, actually, I was going to um, show a video, but I don't think I can uh, because it's prohibited, it's YouTube. So. <laughs> no. Well, I don't think so. I tried earlier when I was sitting up here, it was, I think it's blocked. <laughs> See if it wants to, nah, doesn't want to. Okay, never mind. But, um, Yes, uh, the reason why we got this uh, edition was that uh, we've, we've held uh, a few meetings with, uh, with all the, the core programmers of, uh, of QGIS in, in Nødebo, uh, in Denmark, and um, actually it's partly uh, due to... Um, this person that you met, Lena, Lena Fischer, that is uh, very passionate uh, about uh, QGIS and uh, has uh, a lot of uh, contacts in the QGIS uh, community and has uh, gotten them to Denmark on several occasions. So, um, so we're quite proud of that. So I thought after one year, uh, 250 members, how about these members? What, what, uh, what do we know about our members? So I made a, a quick survey, um, and I found out that, uh, okay, so most of them have only, uh, about half of them have only used QGIS for a few years, um, or have just started using it. Uh, so does that mean we're slow adapters? Maybe. Uh, I think it's uh, because um, I went to a meeting uh, in, uh, in Forest School where Lena works, f I think three, four years ago, and we found that uh, QGIS wasn't ready at that point, but I must say the development is so fast within QGIS that it's definitely ready now, and I think in many uh, aspects it's surpassed uh, a lot of functionality that we used to get with uh, MapInfo. So, um, so in that uh, respect, we uh, we're, we're sure we uh, we want to go that way. Um, but as I will come uh, to later, it's not always easy. Uh, it's a transformation, I think someone said. Uh, yes, and um, only ten percent of our members have switched completely. A few municipalities have a. Uh, completely scrapped all the other licensed products and only uh, running uh, QGIS. Uh, but uh, the rest of us, including uh, my agency, are still relying on uh, MapInfo and ArcGIS. 
And most of our members use a variety of open source products. Uh, I have seen all of you with the different stickers for all these PostGIS and GeoServer, OpenLayers, Leaflet, all of that. So um, there's a, a lot of uh, good things happening uh, on that, and we are sharing that information also. Um, the reason people state that they want to start using QGIS is most notably to save money. Uh, but as we've also touched about, <laughs> uh, it's initially it might not just save you money the first day you start using QGIS. So, but I might get back to that. Um, yes, and a lot of uh, people encounter different problem, uh, problems in uh, in trying to move to QGIS. Um, they don't. They they lack the the competences. Uh, uh, within their organization, they don't have uh, all the staff that they need with the proper skills within QGIS because if you want to uh, make training courses, you need uh, staff to uh, to spend time of, on that. And uh, also, we have met, even in my uh, organization especially, a lot of resistance from our users. Uh, we have users with 15, 20 years experience within MapInfo and they are not keen on changing from one day to the other. <laughs> so it's going to take some time. But uh, I might get into um, how that might be possible. So we'll start off. Um, Svana is Agency for Water and Nature Management in Danish. Um, our, our original situation two years ago, we were 1,200 employees. We had more than 400 MapInfo licenses and 40 ArcGIS licenses, and we didn't have anyone with QGIS. Uh, we also had a lot of flat files and folders and copies of them in both MapInfo format and ArcGIS, and this could lead to some problems when some that used MapInfo updated their version and maybe forgot to update the ArcGIS one. And also, mm, little or no metadata was there. So, of course, we want to uh, be more uh, modernized and, uh, and move. Uh, so, basically, to reduce the number of uh, MapInfo and ArcGIS licenses, we, um, we wrote to all our MapInfo users just saying, um, unless you have a good reason <laughs> for using MapInfo and our QGIS, we are we're going to take away your license uh, unless you write back to us and, and give us a reason. So with that in mind, I think we got down to about 50 <laughs> having for users. So uh, that was one way to go about it. Maybe a little harsh, but we still have some map info users. <coughs> and uh, we want to structure all our data um, in a database. We want to have metadata, we want to use open source WebGIS, and we want to use open source mobile platforms. So uh, we managed to reduce uh, MapInfo quite considerably. Uh, we also managed to uh, reduce uh, ArcGIS, and we have uh, about, I think, maybe 60, 70 now uh, QGIS uh, users. And we've set up our metadata system, um, which links up to a, a national metadata site and host our metadata there. Uh, we're about halfway, so it's okay, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we're still working on uh, getting uh, all our data to a database. Um, it's a big uh, project, but um, we are still working on that. We, uh, we do use some open source components in our WebGIS, but it's not completely open all of the, the code. So. so firstly, over this summer, we got uh, divided into two agencies, and that takes time and resources. Uh, and secondly, um, it's really hard to, uh, we sit in a IT digitalization uh, department and, and, and make services for, for the rest of the ministry, but, but to, 
to make the other departments prioritize these subjects that we think are important uh, can be hard from time to time. So um, even to make them uh, register their metadata, which they are responsible for, can be a problem. As I mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of resistance uh, from our MapInfo users. And it's, um, so basically we've just uh, had problems also uh, with all the files lying around, uh, which one uh, is the right file to keep. So this is a, a big project that uh, we have started and will not be finished soon. So um, I think what, what I've learned is that to convince people to, to change from uh, from MapInfo and ArcGIS to, to QGIS in our organization, we need to get out there and show it. We need to get out and, sh uh, and look at what they're doing and show them how QGIS can solve their job. And often we can do it better and faster, but we need to show them. We need to have a practical case and say, okay, show me what you're doing and I'll show you how to do it better. And and we've had a, a few success uh, stories. Uh, Atlas uh, map uh, is really good for making a lot of maps really quickly. And uh, they can see, OK, that's a really good feature. Uh, it's not in map info, so maybe we will start using QGIS. And we uh, make the argument of uh, why they need to do their metadata, uh, because as a ministry, we make a lot of decisions based on our data. But sometimes people grab the wrong data and they're outdated. So this is very important for us. And lastly, we, uh, we started um, <coughs> to write our GIS strategy, uh, a new strategy which we will incorporate with the uh, accept of management that uh, this is the way forward and once it's got <laughs> top management signature. We can move ahead, and uh, we will probably get uh, the rest of the ministry and middle middle level uh, leaders in the other departments to to come our way. So um, we have a few plugins, uh, nothing uh, too complicated, because a lot of our users are in the fields, and they just need to. Uh, be able to plot in their, their data, or maybe they just need to make some corrections to data. Or um, So it's, it's not uh, very complicated, but what they do need is um, to find, to quickly uh, get the, to the right area. So actually, this was also um, an argument that was made in the, the previous presentation. The, um, the three legs that you have free software, free data, and, and some lessons also. But uh, especially here, it's, uh, it's very notable that uh, the Danish government uh, a few years ago uh, set free a lot of uh, the basic core data in Denmark. Uh, all the, the houses, all the company data, all the addresses, uh, all the maps, uh, topographic maps, uh, auto photo, everything is completely free and uh, serviced for, for all of Denmark. So this made it possible for private, small private companies to, uh, to make some plugins for us. So uh, the, uh, the first, uh, no, the GeoSearch Denmark is, is really good because it's just an elastic search. And you, and you write, start writing something and it finds uh, uh, road names, city names, uh, postal codes, anything, and you just go down the list uh, and click, and it zooms in and shows you exactly where you need to go. So that uh, makes it uh, much easier to, for, for people to, to start finding where they need to go in the map. And then uh, we have uh, Court for Suning is our um, uh, geodata agency that provides all our data. Uh, they are available in uh, in QGIS also. I don't know if I can show, but so basically, it's all services. Uh, 
these are all the different uh, topographic uh, maps. We have all our um, boundaries from uh, municipality and post districts and regions and even uh, church uh, areas uh, for church goes. And we have historical backgrounds and we have the, um, the DT, uh, what's it called, a uh, height model and terrain model for, for all of Denmark. Um, and we have um, here also uh, all the, the parcels in Denmark, um, which gets uh, updated every night. So every morning you have a new uh, complete uh, map of all the Danish parcels. And then you have uh, the newest auto photo. Right now there's only one, but there will be more. Normally we have a spring photo and a summer photo. Um, and then... Uh, a lot of uh, extra uh, services uh, that uh, are used. Uh, for example, there's uh, some house numbers or <laughs> traffic and techniques and nature, uh, municipality. So, so this is very uh, useful uh, for our users. Ah, starts over. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, so also we put uh, we have a lot of people working on uh, different plugins, and uh, we have a, a great uh, community also on GitHub. A lot of people post their things there, like uh, I can see also here. So it's, it's really useful. And then um, I mentioned the Atlas Print Composer, uh, but also um, I just. We don't use uh, remote sensing as much because Denmark is so well registered in every sense of the word. Uh, it's a small country and we have aerial photos every year, maybe twice a year. So, um, <coughs> but initially I started off with remote sensing um, in, uh, in Laos, in Thailand and the Philippines um, for watershed management and for forest cover and I really liked it, and I, I missed it a little bit in my in my work in Denmark because I never had a chance really to to do uh, remote sensing after I got uh, back to uh, to Denmark. So, but recently uh, there was um, a, a Danish uh, space uh, strategy. Um, we co-fund uh, the Sentinel satellites that uh, EU sends up. Uh, can't remember how many billions of euro they spent, but uh, it's a considerable amount. And, and Denmark also contribute, of course, a smaller share, we're a small country. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the government uh, made this strategy and we gave uh, an input and they said, it's funny, we spend all of these millions of, uh, of euro on, on these satellites, but not a lot of uh, Danish agencies are using them. So is there any chance that we can uh, maybe use them? Uh, so there was, a, there was a, uh, the innovation fund in Denmark said, uh, well, we're going to uh, give you some money if you can come up with a good project of how to use satellite and uh, images in Denmark. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's the project that uh, we're starting up now. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot to uh, tell you. <laughs> This is, uh, I started off uh, trying this plugin, Simmer Automatic Classification plugin. It's actually, it's really good if, if you want to start up with, with using remote sensing. Um, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to download. Uh, you, you have to go onto uh, the Sentinel uh, hub and, 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 and uh, register, but then you can uh, log in here and you can download uh, map info and Sentinel, uh, Images and you um, you just uh, give uh, the co corner coordinates and then uh, it finds all the, the images you can set the from this date to that date and you can uh, you get a preview shot so you can see how much uh, a cloud cover is it worth uh, downloading and you can classify it it helps you classify it uh, you can do all sorts of things with it um, so it's a good plugin. But for me, in my daily work, I don't have time for this. 
um, which is why um, we thought if we're going to use satellite images, we're going to make them more easily available for everybody, all state agencies in Denmark, and even uh, all municipalities and everyone. So the project that we are proposing uh, may be a little bit like yours. This was just cut over this for now. Uh, the, project, the project is called Change Detection uh, Dynamic Denmark. And it's funded by the Innovation Fund uh, because they want to increase the use of satellite data, specifically the new Sentinel satellites. So we have a project team uh, just been formulated. Uh, it's a private company, DHI, GRASS. Um, it's uh, originally um, formed uh, in my... Uh, University University of Copenhagen. It was a uh, it was a project there that eventually led to uh, the startup of a of a non-profit uh, company that uh, specializes in remote sensing. And they have uh, worked with uh, a lot of uh, governments and uh, organizations around the world, uh, Asia and also in Latin America, different places. So we want to develop uh, something. Uh, Innovative for Denmark, uh, some, we have uh, the university, uh, technical university, they, are, they have worked a lot on, on these algorithms. Uh, so we want to, in a reliable fashion, automatically uh, screen large time series for changes in key areas uh, such as agriculture, infrastructure and forestry. So this is the project. Um, and we are actually also because of uh, one of the project partners, I think it's uh, Forest of the World or something, doing uh, different work uh, around Latin America. Uh, they, uh, they are also in there, so there's also a case, I uh, can't remember from where. Uh, um, so, that's, so there's two forest uh, monitoring cases in, in this project. And uh, we... We want to develop the tools so we can. Uh, so basically, yeah, I just have to say because uh, what I it comes down here with with the plugin, I was able to do some pairwise comparison, but I found that I got when I compare two pictures, images, and then another two pictures, I didn't get quite the same results because there are slight deviations. I got what. It's also called false positives and false negatives. Actually, change where there's actually isn't change and missing an actual change. So we want to go a step further and use multiple uh, images in the in the change uh, analysis. Uh, it's not uh, my field to do the actual algorithms, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see if this is possible. We have also had uh, a case where we used um, both Sentinel-1 and 2, where Sentinel-1 has uh, radar, the SARS data, uh, because uh, one of our problems uh, in my agency is that whenever there's a, a big storm in Denmark, uh, maybe every five, ten years, it knocks down uh, a lot of forest. Uh, they can get so severe that uh, one region is uh, maybe more than 20% uh, loss in, uh, in their forest. But we need to, uh, to get a really quick overview of, of the damages. And uh, with storms, you often have cloud cover covers. So, uh, so we tried using SARS. And We've had uh, medium good results, but that's why we want to uh, use multiple pictures uh, to to try and see if we can get it better. This is actually uh, from from that project where we are. It's a little dark. Uh, let's see, the red one is the automatic one uh, on the right, and the yellow one is uh, what has actually been registered in the forest as being uh, knocked over. So we found it to be maybe 85% accurate. Problem is, um, 
it can only take the, the bigger areas. If there's only one or two th trees that's knocked down, we, we can't identify them. So yes, I, me I mentioned that uh, earlier. Um, these are some of the data that have been uh, released. Uh, all about individuals, businesses, real properties, uh, aerial photos, topographic maps. So we, uh, so far after the data has been set free, we have really seen uh, an exponential use in our data, uh, maybe 10, 20 fold, and a lot of, um, of solutions from both uh, uh, public and private companies that, that use our data in a innovative and, and new way. So, and also, uh, I think I, uh, yeah, the more people are using our data, the better the data get because we, they report when they find uh, errors and mis uh, in our data. So, uh, it's a it's a good way to to have your data tested, set it free, and people will report back if there's problems with your data. That was just to show that this is the organization that we're working with. Uh, these are some of the projects they've done uh, around the world. So uh, a quick word about the free beer, or the lack of free beer, maybe. <laughs> so uh, someone said, uh, you cannot sell a free beer, but you can sell the knowledge of how to open the beer or a ready-to-use bottle opener or some ideas on how to enjoy uh, the free beer the most. In other words, <laughs> what they're talking about is um, how to implement uh, open source software, how to adapt it uh, to your needs, and uh, also making courses. I think I left that out, but also training is important. Um, and maintenance cost. So, free, day, uh, free software is not free to use. But, in the long run, you get the freedom to choose what you spend your money on. Uh, and uh, one of them could be training, uh, or uh, it could be uh, adaptation, uh, development to suit your needs. So you, you still get a lot of freedom, but it's not free. So, yeah. Let's see. Just uh, a few pictures from uh, a similar uh, meeting in Germany last month, Phosphogene in Bonn. Um, just uh, uh, all of these are uh, links, and uh, below there, all sessions from from this meeting is also available as a, as video. So if you go in and you find a, a, a topic that you find interesting, you can you can watch the video without going to Germany. So just to mention it, and I just mentioned a few of them that I found was uh, was interesting. That was it from me. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Morten. É, a pena que o vídeo não abriu aqui. A gente assistiu quando esteve lá visitando. Várias pessoas tentando pronunciar a palavra Nudebu, que é uma cidade na Dinamarca, que é o nome da nova versão do, do QGIS.